Okay, I'm going to take you through Form 3 work, biology. In Form 3, we have normally four topics. The first topic is classification two. That is the first topic. The second topic is ecology. The third topic is reproduction. That is reproduction in plants and animals. Then the fourth topic is growth and development. Growth and development. So allow me to take you through the second topic, which is ecology. Before I start, we must be conversant with what is ecology. What is ecology? So to start with, we started the definition. What is ecology? Ecology is the study of interrelationships, the study of interrelationships of living organisms and to their environment. The study of interrelationships of living organisms to each other and to their surrounding or and to their environment. How do we relate living organisms? You know biology is a branch of science that deals with the study of living organisms. And the living organisms are classified into two, plants and animals. So how do living organisms interact to each other and to their environment, the immediate surrounding. For example, you as a human being, how are you relating with the immediate surrounding, with the immediate environment? How are you relating with plants? Do you cut out deforestation? Do you cut out poaching? Do you pollute the environment? How do you relate with the environment? Then after understanding the definition, the study of interrelationship of living organisms and to their environment, Whereby I'm insisting environment means the immediate surrounding. Then we go to concepts. We talk about concepts in ecology. Concepts in ecology, we are talking about terms. Some of the terms we are going to come across when we are going to discuss about this topic, ecology. Some of the terms you are supposed to be conversant with or to understand. The first term you are going to come across is autoecology. Autoecology. When you talk about autoecology, we mean about the study of a single species in the ecosystem. The study of a single species in an ecosystem. For example, you are in an ecosystem, for example, talk about you are in an environment like uh, Lake Victoria. You are studying about Nile Patch the study of a single species in an ecosystem. The second concept is synecology. Synecology, the study of many species in an ecosystem. The study of many species in an ecosystem. You are going to that an ecosystem, for example, take it as a lake or a bond. You are going to study about crabs, you are going to study about fish, you are going to study about the aquatic plants, so the study of many species interacting to each other in an ecosystem. That's what we talk about in ecology. Then the next term is carrying capacity. Carrying capacity is the maximum number of living organisms a particular area can comfortably support without depleting the available resources. Depleting here I'm talking about without finishing the available resources. The maximum number of living organisms a particular area can comfortably support without depletion of the available resources. For example, you're talking about 100 antelopes. 100 antelopes in a savanna grassland, which is approximately one I talk about 1,000 1, square meter, 1,000 square meter. 
the vegetation which are there which can support these antelopes without depletion, without finishing the available resources. We'll talk about carrying capacity. The maximum number of living organisms or the maximum number of species a particular area can comfortably support without depletion of the available resources. Depletion here, now talk about without depletion or without depleting means without finishing the available resources. The next term is ecosystem. An ecosystem is a natural unit. A natural unit, a natural unit composed of or made up of, composed of biotic and abiotic factors. whose interactions lead to a self-sustaining system, a natural unit composed or made up of biotic and abiotic factors, whose interactions lead to a self-sustaining system. When I talk about biotic, I mean living, living conditions. When I talk about abiotic, I mean about physical. I'm talking about physical or environmental factors. So a natural unit composed of biotic and abiotic factors whose interactions lead to a self-sustaining system. Then the next term and to talk about is biosphere. Biosphere or ecosphere, the same meaning. When talk about biosphere or ecosphere, we're talking about the part of the atmosphere the part of the earth and atmosphere occupied by living organisms. The part of the earth and the atmosphere occupied by living organisms. That is biosphere or ecosphere. Next term is habitat. When we talk about habitat, we mean a specific locality with a particular set of conditions where living organism occupies a specific locality or a specific location with a particular set of conditions occupied by living organism or where a living organism stays, a habitat. For example, talk about habitat, <coughs> excuse me, and talk about aquatic and terrestrial. Terrestrial means land, aquatic, talk about water, aquatic habitat. That aquatic habitat, that habitat, for example, if it is that Indian Ocean, it has some conditions. And with such conditions, we are having some living organisms which are occupying that place. So a specific locality with a particular set of conditions where a living organism occupies or where a living organism stays. The next, you talk about niche. When we talk about niche or ecological niche, we talk about the position occupied by a living organism and the role that organism plays the position occupied by a living organism and the role it plays. That's what we talk about niche, or the same as ecological what? Ecological niche. Ecological niche, or you can just simply say niche. The position occupied by a living organism in a habitat and the role it plays. The position occupied by a living organism in a habitat and the role it plays. Remember, I said habitat means a specific locality with a particular set of conditions where a living organism lives or where a living organism occupies. Then after understanding some of those few terminologies we are going to come across, then next we can talk about the factors in an ecosystem. Factors in an ecosystem. Factors 
in an ecosystem. Remember, later on, when we started, I said, when we talk about this topic, ecology, the first one, I started with the divination. After dividing the divination, we came to concepts. Concepts means the terms, terminologies used. Then the second one, the third one, sorry, we're supposed to talk about factors. Factors in an ecosystem. After talking about factors in an ecosystem, then we're going to talk about energy flow in an ecosystem. Energy flow in an ecosystem. Under energy flow in ecosystem, we're going to talk about food chain. We're going to talk about food webs. Food webs. After talking that, we go to what we call nitrogen cycle. After nitrogen cycle, we go to human diseases. Then we talk about pollution. Pollution. This is just a breakdown about the topic ecology. I've defined the ecology specifically saying is the study of interrelationships of living organisms and to their environment. How living organisms are relating to each other and to their surrounding. Environment here means surrounding, the immediate surrounding. Then we have said some of the terminology, some of the concepts which are we are going to come across when we are going to discuss through this topic ecology. Some of the terms used, terminology, some of the concepts you are supposed to be familiar with. <coughs> we have defined some. We have talked about synecology, said about the ecology, out ecology, the study of a single species, synecology, the study of many species interacting to each other. We have talked about carrying capacity. I said it's the maximum number of living organisms a particular area can comfortably support without depletion of the available resources. Then we have talked about biosphere. I've said biosphere is the part of the earth and atmosphere occupied by living organisms. I have talked about niche or ecological niche, say the position occupied by a living organism in a habitat and the role it plays in that habitat. And remember, I said habitat is a specific locality with a particular set of conditions. Then after that, now we talk about factors in an ecosystem. That is now the second, the third, the third. As I said, this is just the breakdown. Factors in an ecosystem. I said, what's an ecosystem? A natural unit composed or made up of biotic and abiotic factors whose interactions lead to a self-sustaining system. I said biotic, we're talking about living, living conditions. We talk about abiotic, non-living or physical factors or environmental factors. So how does biotic, living and unliving, interact to each other and at the end leading to a self-sustaining system? Nothing coming from outside, so it's leading to a self-sustaining system. So those factors in an ecosystem are classified into two. The first one is biotic. Biotic factors. And the second one, is abiotic. Abiotic factors, I'm saying these are physical, I'm saying these are non living, or can just say these are environmental factors. How does the living and non living interact with each other and at the end to bring about a self sustaining system? When we talk about biotic factors, I'm saying these are the living conditions in an ecosystem, then these biotic factors are further or are grouped into five. The first one is competition. The second one is parasitism. 
parasitism. The third one is symbiosis. The fourth one is predation. The fifth one is saprophytism. Saprophytism. Biotic factors, living conditions in an ecosystem. When we talk about competition, competition, what is competition? You can say just competition is a struggle. The struggle to survive or the struggle to outdo each other. Remember we said ecology, the study of interrelationships of living organisms to each other and to their surrounding or to their environment. When you talk about competition, competition I'm saying is the struggle to outdo each other. You are competing, you are struggling. So when you talk about competition here, yeah, there are two types of competition. We have interspecific and intra specific competition. Competition can only occur. You can have this word competition if the resources are scarce. Scarce, the same as limited, <coughs> not enough. Competition can only and only occur when the resources which the resources which are available are not enough to sustain the living organisms. It is not enough, it is limited. Then I'm saying there are two types of competition in an ecosystem. Talk about interspecific and intraspecific. Interspecific competition is the competition between same species. Same species. You talk about starting from we start with interspecific, not intraspecific. Interspecific competition is the competition between different species. Please, not that. Different species. Interspecific. You can say interclass competition. Between this class and the other class, inter. Talk about interspecific competition. <coughs> competition between different species competing for the same scarce resources. For example, when you talk about a lion, a lion is a different species, and you have a leopard, it's a different species. They are competing for three antelopes, or they're competing for three gazelles. Remember the lion and the leopard, different species, but both of them, they're feeding on the same food. Both of them, they're feeding on this gazelle. And the gazelles, for example, there are three or there are two. And you have here, you have 10 lions, you have here 50 leopards. They are competing for the same scarce resource, interspecific. Different species competing for the same scarce resources. Like you are a human species, my human being, and we have, for example, a monkey. And both of them, they are competing for scarce maize crops, for example, in a field, interspecific. Interspecific is the competition between same species competing for the same scarce resource. Remember competition, I said, can only occur when the resources are limited or scarce, not enough, and the organisms. Competition can only occur when the resources is insufficient or scarce, not available. So I'm saying in the specific, different species competing for the same scarce resource. And the competition cannot occur if the species which are available are not feeding on the same. For example, we cannot say there is competition between a human being and, for example, a vulture, which is feeding on dead bodies. There is no competition there. So competition occurs when resources which are available are not enough scarce, and the same species or different species are feeding on that scarce resource. Scarce resource. So in the specific, same species competing 
for the same scarce resources. For example, you have, take for example, you have 100. You have 100 lions. And the available food, for example, take for example, the available resource, for example, if it is the antelopes or gazelles, say for example, we have two. You have two gazelles and 100 lions competing for them same, same scarce resource. So same species competing for the same scarce resource, resources. So how does competition affect the distribution of living organisms in an ecosystem? How does competition affect distribution of living organisms in an ecosystem? Remember when you talk about factors in an ecosystem, you are saying those factors are two, biotic and biotic. What is an ecosystem? A natural unit composed of abiotic, living and non-living, biotic and abiotic, whose interactions lead to a self-sustaining system. So how does competition affect the distribution of living organisms in a, a habitat? When you talk about the two types of competition, interspecific and intraspecific, take for example Nairobi National Park. You go to a certain area in that Nairobi National Park, you find we have 100 lions. 100 lions living in the same area. You cannot expect, for example, if they are feeding on gazelles or antelopes, you cannot expect to find also gazelles living in the same, same area. So where competition is stiff, where competition is stiff, one of the competing species, which has no favorable adaptation to survive, eventually is going to be eliminated eventually is going to be eliminated. And finally, under competition, organisms compete for food, also what they say, nutrients, meats, can talk about space, can talk about light. Organisms compete for resources like food, or nutrients, they compete for meats, they also compete for space. For example, you take a place which is overcrowded, overcrowded by crops. For example, you take this room. You have uh, 1,000. You have 1,000 trees of, for example, mangoes. At the end of the day, you're going to find that some of the mango species are going to dry and wither off due to what? Due to competition, water, nutrients from the soil due to competition for light. So you'll find some are going to grow tall, 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 which are favorable adaptation to survive. And those ones which are going to be now undercover, they're going at the end of the day, die or wither off and dry off. The next, you talk about parasitism. When you talk about parasitism, it is a mode of feeding. It's a mode of feeding relationship where one organism it's a mode of feeding relationship where one organism called the parasite, mode of feeding relationship, parasitism, mode of feeding relationships, mode of feeding relationship where one organism called parasite lives in or on another organism, another organism called the pre. A mode of feeding relationship where one organism called the parasite lives in, in means inside or on, outside, another organism called <coughs> the pre. Then from there we have, we have two types of parasites. Two types of parasites. We have endoparasites, 
and we have ectoparasites. That's why I'm saying where one organism called the parasite lives in. If that parasite is living inside a living organism, and another organism called, not called the prey, and another organism called the host, I'm sorry, called the host. Mode of feeding relationship where one organism called the parasite lives in, or another organism called the host, called the host. Sorry, excuse me, not the parasite, called the host. Where one organism called the host. A mode of feeding relationship where one organism called the parasite lives in, inside, or on, outside, another organism called the host. Then I'm saying there are two types of parasites. We have endoparasites and ectoparasites. Those which live inside a living organism, they are called endoparasites. For example, you are talking about tapeworm, liver fluke, roundworm, living inside a human being. Then the ectoparasites living on the surface outside. For example, you can talk about a tick on, on the body surface, on the body of, for example, you're talking of a cow. Ectoparasites. Parasites which live outside the body of a living organism. Remember parasitism, you cannot, for example, talk about a dead person who is being attacked by, for example, termites, then you say that is parasitism. The host must be a living organism. It must be a living organism. The parasite derives nutrients, it derives shelter from the host without necessarily killing the host, but it can eventually transmit diseases which may end up now killing the host. The parasite derives nutrients, it also derives shelter from the host without necessarily killing the host. But eventually it can transmit diseases which are going to weaken and kill the host, but it is not necessarily killing the, the host. Then the second is symbiosis. Symbiosis is a mode of feeding relationship where the two organisms benefit mutually. There is mutual benefit. Symbiosis. Two living organisms benefit mutually. An example is you talk about the nitrogen fixing bacteria. The nitrogen fixing bacteria and the legumes. and the leguminous plants. The nitrogen fixing bacteria and the leguminous plants is an example of symbiosis relationship. The nitrogen fixing bacteria fixes nitrogen to the leguminous plants. The leguminous plants also provide shelter, water, and carbohydrates from the process of photosynthesis. What are leguminous plants? Leguminous plants are plants that grow in nitrogen. Plants that grow in nitrogen deficient soils. Plants that grow in nitrogen deficient soils. Nitrogen deficient soils means there is insufficient nitrogen in the soil and the nitrogen is necessary for the protein synthesis in plants. So those plants which grow in nitrogen deficient soils are called leguminous plants. So how do they obtain nitrogen? Through the nitrogen-fixing bacteria. The nitrogen-fixing bacteria will convert the free nitrogen from the atmosphere into nitrates. Then the nitrates, the nitrates are going to be absorbed by the leguminous plants. I'm repeating, I'm saying the nitrogen-fixing bacteria, it is a bacteria that lives or that stays in the root nodules, in the root nodules of leguminous plants. What are root nodules? If this is a plant, 
this plant is growing there. These are the roots. These are the roots. These are the roots. This is a nodule. The nodules are the swellings. They are the swellings. Nodules are swellings, which are shown by leguminous plants. Those plants which grow in nitrogen-deficient soil. There is insufficient, no enough nitrogen in the soil. And nitrogen is necessary for the protein synthesis by these plants. So how do they benefit mutually? Mutually means if I'm benefiting, you are benefiting. If I give you this, you give me this. As much as not in equal measure. The nitrogen-fixing bacteria, also which is called rhizopium, leaves stays in these root nodules, the root swellings of these plants, then it converts the nitrogen into nitrates. Remember, plants take nitrogen in the form of nitrates, not as free nitrogen from the atmosphere. Then the nitrates, these nitrates are going to be absorbed by the roots, by these leguminous plants. Then the nitrogen-fixing bacteria is obtaining shelter. Remember, it is staying here. Is obtaining shelter. It is obtaining carbohydrates from the process of photosynthesis from these plants. Then also, it is getting some water. So both two living organisms are benefiting from each other. Because we say biology, plants and animals. This is an animal, then that is also a plant. They are benefiting from each other. Much of benefit. Then, this means, now how does it bring about distribution of living organisms in an ecosystem? <coughs> we say the ecosystem, a natural unit composed of biotic and abiotic factors whose interactions lead to a self-sustaining system. So it means definitely where there are so many nitrogenous nitrogen fixing bacteria, where there is so many nitrogen fixing bacteria, remember when I talk about bacteria, there are many. When I talk about bacterium, it is one. So areas where we have so many nitrogen fixing bacteria, definitely means you can find a large group of these leguminous plants. In other words, to say, where you are seeing the leguminous plants are surviving, it means inside that soil we have the nitrogen fixing bacteria because they depend on each other. Much of benefit. The next is predation, another biotic. <coughs> Remember, these are all biotic. Talk about predation. Predation is a mode of feeding relationship. Where? Mode of feeding relationship. Talk about predation. Sorry, predation. Is a mode of feeding relationship, a mode of feeding relationship where one organism, where one organism, mode of feeding relationship where one organism called the predator. Predator hunts and kills one organism or another organism called the pre. And it feeds on it either holy or partially. A mode of feeding relationship where one organism called the predator hunts. It must hunt. Does not find it just available. Hunts and it kills another living organism called the prey. And it feeds on it either wholly or partially. 
Take this as an example, a leopard hunting a gazelle. Then this leopard, if it's going to kill this gazelle and feeds it wholly or part of it, then that biotic relationship is called predation. Or you find this leopard, for example, it is hunting on a gazelle, then it's going to kill it and maybe sucks blood <coughs> or eats some parts of the body and leaving the other. That's what I'm saying. It feeds on it wholly or partially. So under predation, you are supposed to understand the adaptations of the predator and adaptations of the prey to survive in an ecosystem. So the one which is hunting the enemy is the predator. And now the food is the prey. Can talk about the adaptations of the predator, predators. Most predators, they have strong jaws for grasping and tearing the flesh from the prey. Some, like the hawk, they have a sharp eyesight so that they can, from a distance, they can be able to sense and locate the position of the prey. Then also can talk about the adaptations of the prey. Most preys, some of them, they camouflage. When talk about camouflage, they just go and hide in a background or in an area which resembles that background. Camouflaging. Let me give an example. When you talk about camouflage, talk about a chameleon. When a chameleon comes on this whiteboard, it can change the color to look white. So that when the predator is coming, the enemy is coming, can just pass by without necessarily noticing that the prey is around. Some mimic. Some mimic. When talk mimicking, they just copy the behavior of an edible animals. For example, you talk about the walking stick insects. It just mimics an organism which is non-edible, which is not edible, so that when the enemy, which is not the predator, is passing by, cannot be able to notice like this is food. Even some, they produce bad smell, which can scare away the predator, the enemy. Then the next talk about Saprophytism. Before saprophytism, then you talk about predation. How does predation affect the distribution of living organisms in an ecosystem? An area where we have so many predators, when we have so many predators, it means in that area there are so many preys. Of course, we are finding there are so many people crowded there. It means there is food, there is food, for example. So where areas where we have so many predators means they have so many preys. But eventually as time goes by, you are going to find that when the predators have started to migrate away, it means the number of prey have reduced in terms of population. So areas where we have so many predators means there is sufficient prey. But eventually when you see the predators are dying over, they are migrating, it means the prey are insufficient. The next is saprophytism. When we talk about saprophytism, it is also a mode of feeding relationship where one organism called the saprophyte, one organism called the saprophyte, feeds on dead, decaying. It feeds on dead, decaying, organic matter. That is saprophytism. One organism called the saprophyte, feeding on dead, decaying organic matter. Remember, don't confuse saprophytism with parasitism. Parasitism, I said, one organism called the parasite lives in or another organism called the host. And the Okay. 
I'm saying don't confuse parasitism and saprophytism. Parasitism. For example, when somebody calls you a parasite, somebody can tell you you are just a parasite. You are a parasite to your parents. What does it mean? You are just feeding, you are just taking their money for school fees, they are clothing you, they are feeding you, and at the end of the day, there is nothing you are taking home. You are not taking a result at home. So it means you are a parasite. One organism feeds, one organism lives in, or another organism called the host. And the host must be living. But when you talk about saprophytes, uh, an organism which is living and is feeding on dead, decaying organic matter. For example, you talk about the vultures. The vulture which feeds on dead, decaying bodies. Or you can also talk about some of the decomposers are also saprophytes. Talk about the bacteria, the fungus, which is working on a dead, decaying organic material. That is to talk about saprophytism. The saprophytes are important in an ecosystem because they help in recycling of the nutrients. When a living organism dies, it is decomposed, then the nutrients are recycled. That's all about biotic factors in an ecosystem. When you talk about abiotic factors, abiotic factors, these are physical or non-living environmental factors in an ecosystem. These factors can talk about, we talk about rainfall, talk about temperature, Temperature, talk about wind, you talk about atmospheric pressure and humidity, talk about atmospheric pressure, atmospheric pressure, you also talk about humidity. This is just, for example, abiotic factors, non-living environmental factors that affect the distribution of living organisms in... I also talk about sunlight in an ecosystem. When you talk about rainfall, mainly we are talking about source of water. Areas with well-distributed rainfall tend to have well distributed of living organisms. Areas with poorly distributed rainfall, it is very rare to find a good population of living organisms. And living organisms here, I'm talking about plants and animals. Rainfall is a source of water. Water is needed in the process of photosynthesis. Remember, water is one of the raw materials in the process of photosynthesis. So, Areas with well, remember I'm talking about well distributed rainfall, tend to have well distributed of living organisms. Don't confuse you, you're talking about areas with a lot of rainfall, causing floods, causing havoc, causing disaster. Well distributed rainfall throughout the year tend to have well distribution of living organisms. You find well distributed plants, also you can find also the well distributed animals, because also animals, they need water for survival for biological reactions in the body. When you talk about temperature, temperature, most living organisms, their body cells, they function very well under optimum temperature. When you talk about optimum temperature, you're talking not too low, not too high. Because of the biological reactions in the body, which normally depend on optimum temperature. Then, talk about wind. Wind is advantageous and disadvantageous. How wind is advantageous? Wind assists insects, those insects which search for scent, to go the, for the sake of scent to go and suck nectar. I'm sorry for sucking nectar. The wind wafts the scent then the insects, they follow that scent, that smell, to that area where, for example, that nectar is available. But wind 
also, I'm saying it's also advantageous in pollination. For example, the wind pollinated flowers. When you talk about pollination, the transfer of pollen grains from the anther to the stigma, vice versa. So the wind is necessary in pollination. It's also necessary in dispersion, dispersal, the spreading of the spirits, the seeds. But wind is advantageous because strong wind can break branches, can lead to the falling of fruits and the seeds before maturity. So areas with strong wind, you tend to have poorly populated living organisms, especially the, especially the plants. Because remember also wind can lead to excessive loss of water from the body surface. For example, strong wind can lead to excessive transpiration, which can lead to permanent wilting. Permanent wilting means not the death of the plants. Then talk about atmospheric pressure. When you talk about the mountainous areas, the mountainous or high altitude areas, the rate of atmospheric pressure is very high. It's very low, sorry. And when the atmospheric pressure is very low, it tends to lead to increase of water loss from the plants. But when the atmospheric pressure is high, the rate of transpiration is low. Then humidity, the amount of water vapor in the atmosphere. The amount of water vapor in the atmosphere. When humidity is low, the rate of water loss from the body surface in form of evaporation or transpiration is high, which may lead to, in case of plants, to permanent wilting. So when humidity is high, the rate of water loss from the body surface is low. But if humidity is low, the rate of water loss from the body surface is high, which may lead to desiccation and permanent wilting in case of excessive transpiration. Then after talking about that, that's the biotic factors, living, you can see these are non-living environmental factors that affect the rate of distribution of living organisms in an ecosystem. Biotic are living factors that affect the distribution of living organisms in an ecosystem. Then from there we can go to the energy flow in an ecosystem. Energy flow in an ecosystem. Energy flow in an ecosystem. Energy flow in a natural unit made up of biotic and abiotic factors whose interactions lead to a self-sustaining system. You can see how these abiotic and abiotic they are interacting with each other and at the end there is a self-sustaining system. Then how does energy flow in an ecosystem? Remember, the source of energy, the sun, is the main source of energy in an ecosystem. The sun is the main or the major source of energy in an ecosystem. Talk about that is sun. Then you have here green plants. You have green plants. The green plants are going to trap light in the process of photosynthesis. As we know, in the first stage of photosynthesis, that's the, the light stage, photosynthesis. So the light energy, when it's being trapped, the plants are going to use this source of light in the process of photosynthesis. Because we know the light is the one which is used in the process we call photolysis or photolysis. Photolysis, the splitting of the water molecule into hydrogen atoms and oxygen gas. The hydrogen which are going to combine with carbon-4 oxide in the dark stage, in the dark stage to make the carbohydrates, the simple sugars. So the energy flow in an ecosystem, the sun is the main source of energy in the ecosystem. So how does energy flow in an ecosystem? I'm saying the sun is the main source of energy. Then the plants, the plants, specifically I'm talking about green plants, they are normally called as producers. All living organisms, they depend on plants. The plants are the producers. The plants are the producers. Animals can obtain energy either directly or indirectly. 
directly how by feeding on plants For example you are feeding on cabbages you are feeding on kales you are feeding on groundnuts or indirectly by feeding on other living organisms for example you are feeding meat from the chicken or meat from the camel the camel had already been feeding on green plants so that is indirect indirect not direct then the energy flow in an ecosystem flows from it flows from this is the sun then you have the green plants there the green plants are called the producers then after producers the energy will flow to what you call consumers and under consumers a consumer is the final user of a product but here when we talk about consumers we have several categories and we are talking about some categories of consumers we have primary consumers then we have secondary consumers then we have tertiary consumers then we have quaternary we have the quaternary consumers so you can see we have one two three four categories of consumers the primary consumer take for example you have green plants talk about you have grass is the producer then the grass can be fed by camel then the camel can be fed by human then the human for example can be fed by lion so this is the primary secondary tertiary then the quaternary consumer the lion can talk about the vulture in most cases the quaternary consumers are also classified as decomposers the decomposers are normally placed at the end of the energy flow in an ecosystem so the energy flow in an ecosystem can be represented or can be shown by either use of a food chain or by a food web or can talk about pyramids but now here let's talk about the two when we talk about a food chain it is a linear linear means straight line it is a linear representation of feeding relationship in an ecosystem the linear representation and when we talk about a food chain we normally use arrows the arrows normally show the direction of energy flow in most cases you've been hearing from either the, from the primary section from the primary level that the arrow points the eater the arrow points the eater it points the eater but in the actual sense it is showing the direction of energy flow so it means this arrow means the camel feeds on the grass the human feeds on the camel the lion feeds on the human when the lion maybe dies is going to be fed by the vultures so it is showing where energy is flowing so the energy is flowing from the grass to the camel to the human from the human to the lion to the vultures and we say energy flow in an ecosystem the energy flow in an ecosystem is not 100% is not 100% the energy flow 100 from grass 100 to camel 100 to human being no the energy flow in an ecosystem is not 100 percent from one trophic level to another because of various reasons one some energy can be lost through evaporation some energy can be lost through divication and energy can be lost in a way such that not all the organism is being fed by the succeeding 
consumer. Remember I'm saying the energy flow in an ecosystem can be shown by a food chain, food web. A food chain is a linear, linear means straight line. It's a linear representation of feeding relationship in an ecosystem. And when you are drawing a food chain, we use the arrows. The arrows shows or indicates the direction of energy flow. Then there, it also can be shown by a food web. A food web are several, several interconnecting food chains. Several interconnecting food chains in an ecosystem. For example, you can find here that the grass can also be eaten by a cow. You can find also the human being can feed on a cow. Several interconnecting food chains. The ecosystem makes up what you call a food web. That is, we are talking about the energy flow in an ecosystem. Then in summary, before I end up, before I end up, what have we learned today? What have we discussed so far? We started with, the topic is ecology. The second topic in Form 3, ecology. Then under ecology, we have talked about the divination. What is ecology? The next, we have talked about, after the divination, we have talked about the concepts, terms. Then we have talked about factors in an ecosystem. The factors, you have said, they are divided into, we have biotic, and we have abiotic, Biotic, we have said there are five. Then the abiotic, we have said there are non-living environmental factors, or they are just the physical factors in an ecosystem. Then from there, we have also talked about energy flow in an ecosystem. So when you are revising, to know what you have done, what you have learned, you must be able to know, do you know what is ecology, some terminologies related to ecology. From there, have you known the factors in an ecosystem? What are the biotic factors? Can you be able to discuss them and how they affect the distribution of living organisms in an ecosystem? What are the biotic factors? How do they affect the distribution of living organisms in an ecosystem? Then energy flow in an ecosystem. What is a food chain? What is a food web? Then later on, Tomorrow we are going to discuss about how to draw a food chain, how to construct a food chain, how to construct a food web. Then later on, we'll go to the nitrogen cycle, human diseases, and pollution. Thank you so much.